All right. Hello, everyone. Um, thank you for joining us this afternoon for the virtual launch of Peter Pounding, a retrospective presented by Goose Lane Editions and the Beaverbrook Art Gallery. So my name is Megan. I'm going to be emceeing today, but I promise I'm not going to take up too much of our time because we have a lovely presentation and interview prepared for you between our featured artist, Peter Pounding, and the book's editor, John LaRoe. Um, so when we, well, then we're going to finish things off with a live Q&A. So I'll let you all know that you can start typing your questions in the comments as soon as you want. Um, I'll be monitoring them. Um, I've already prepared myself a cup of tea so that I can sit back and relax and uh, really enjoy some artful conversations. Um, but before we get into that, I have a few introductions and uh, we'll start with an introduction of the book. So Peter Pounding, A Retrospective is a co-publication between Goose Lane Editions and the Beaverbrook Art Gallery. It's a beautiful hardcover book featuring 175 full color images of Pounding's work, along with essays by curators and, crit and critics and a wonderful introduction by John LaRoe himself. So um, for all our local Fredericton viewers, um, there's gonna be signed copies of the book available for purchase at, at Westminster Books. Um, that's located at 88 York Street. And since we're virtual, we know that for all of you who are tuning in from away, signed copies are also gonna be available to order on our website at gooselane.com. But now for what we're really here for, let's introduce um, our speakers. So first we have Peter Pounding. And I'll, Peter Pounding, if you wanna give a wave. Um, so Peter Pounding is simultaneously referred to as a sculptor and a ceramicist, but his art does not fit easy categorization, incorporating and combining elements from one medium into another. His work challenges the viewer to reconsider the object, its form and its function. This inventiveness has resulted in numerous exhibitions, awards and commissions for public art sculptures throughout Canada. And of course we have John LaRoe. Do you wanna give a wave? <laughs> Um, John LaRoe is an award-winning art historian, curator, and architect. He holds a Bachelor of Architecture from McGill University and a Master of Arts in Art History from Concordia University and is currently the Manager of Collections and Exhibitions at the Beaverbrook Art Gallery. He's the author of 13 books, including Building New Brunswick and The Lost City. So now we can really get things started. I'll remind you there's a live Q&A at the end. Um, so feel free to start typing your questions whenever you want as we get into the presentation. Um, and then with that, I think I've talked enough. So I'm gonna pass things over to you, John. Great, okay, thanks so much. Uh, it's, a, it's a real pleasure to be here virtually. And uh, I know when you think of some of the great events in history have been done like this over different screens, you know, there's, there's the moon landing when the NASA headquarters was talking to Neil Armstrong. They were quite far away. So, I mean, if they could do it, I think we can do it here as well. Um, uh, which was right around the same year that, uh, that Peter moved to, uh, to Canada as well. So it's, it's a pleasure to be here. One of the great joys of my life is working with, with our artists and collaborating with them. And this and the exhibition as well at the Beaverbrook has been an extremely uh, rewarding collaboration, certainly with with Peter and with, with his, his wife Beth as well, but with Goose Lane and with Judy Scriver, uh, the designer, I think it's an exquisite book. I mean, I'm a little bit biased, but anyone we've shown it to are just gobsmacked by just the quality, the, the visual sumptuousness, but also the, the integrity of it, that it really speaks to, to this, this story of half a century. I mean, you look at Peter, I mean, he looks, he looks younger than me. So I can't believe he's been at it for, you know, as long as I've been alive. I just turned 52 days ago. Um, and it feels like a long time, but um, you know, without, without further ado, I, I just want to talk to you a little bit about, about Peter's career and then we'll get into to a discussion. But um, I, I've never worked with someone that's been as much of a pleasure uh, as, as with you, Peter, and, and beyond just the work is I think just your character and your generosity has been, been tremendous. So let's get into this. I'm going to talk for about five, six minutes, just about uh, Peter's career here. And here we go.
astounding about Peter's work is, is the level of depth and the immersiveness of being able to see uh, so many layers beyond the object itself. Now, if you go back, I'm sure you, this is in the book. All these photos are in the book, by the way. This is Peter and Beth's wedding photo from, yeah, if you can believe it, it's 1969. I know Peter doesn't look that much different. This is, uh, you know, before they moved to Canada, this is their, their Connecticut wedding transportation. But you could tell, I mean, where the sensibilities, I, I, I don't use the word, well, anyway, the, the sensibilities of these guys, uh, remember as well in 1969, yeah, you had the moon landing, but you also had issues, a lot of political strife in the US, because of Nixon, Vietnam, they wanted to move. And we can certainly uh, kind of resonate with that today, some political and, and social strife down south of the border. It was time for them to come up to Canada. Beth had some family ancestral connections to Canada. And so they chose to move to Markhamville, New Brunswick, which is a small community, uh, you know, settlement, uh, a few minutes outside of Sussex. This is the Pounding Homestead. And this beautiful sort of bucolic and the acres of fields and forests and streams and a wonderful spot. They bought an old farmhouse and the farmhouse where they live is to the left, to the right is uh, Pounding Studio, where actually he's, he's seeing us from us uh, today. He's meeting us in the, the second window there. So. So within this spot, you think it's, it basically exudes this sense of, of old time New Brunswick, kind of 19th century or early 20th century farm. But as I said, and well, in fact, and even when you look at one of the views out of Peter's studio, this is what he sees outside of his studio. So you can be forgiven of thinking, yeah, it's pretty bucolic, pretty safe, um, sort of pretty typical of New Brunswick rural sensibilities, but it's actually anything but. What comes out of this are some of the most inspiring and adventuresome and progressive artworks done in Eastern Canada. Before we get into that, if you go back to the 1970s, just a few years after they moved here and started uh, the ceramic studio, this, this is Peter and Beth, 1974. Uh, one of the greatest artist photos I've ever seen uh, in New Brunswick, but uh, of them in Mactaquac Craft Festival when it was a real going concern uh, people would line up overnight to get in and there he is selling his sort of brown at the time a lot of production ware, houseware pots vases coffee mugs uh, plates that kind of thing but again this is you know a lot of it sort of uh, you know brown brown sort of fired this was his bread and butter for for much of the first decade of his career as he as he sort of worked it out uh, with his with a studio that he built in the kiln in Markhamville which also suffered a fire but he immediately rebuilt but what's astounding about Peter, and I've known this, but I've really discovered through this book and the project, is how someone that in the 1970s was making these by about, you know, 20 years later was making these. And say another 20 years later was making this, which is now in the lobby of the Toronto International Film Festival skyscraper headquarters in downtown Toronto. So you don't get from a brown beige coffee mug to this without having something special and a lot of initiative and drive and certainly with the talent. So, uh, and just so you want to see what actually that is up close, that's actually slumped backlit glass, which a real close up looks something like this. So, I mean, just the idea of something that feels absolutely uh, evocative of sort of 20th century beauty material, but also a little bit of chaos thrown in as well and chance. Uh, going back to Peter's um, 1970s life in Sussex, very much a community-minded person that he and Beth, some friends the Danish, just opened up a store called Jabberwock in downtown Sussex. And they ran it for about 10 years in the late 70s and early 80s where he sold his wares. And this is an early photo. You can see some more sort of, some of the more typical 1970s work. But soon enough, the story of this book is the idea of change and adventure and discovery. And so even within his studio, you can believe it, he, he developed sort of a foundry in the sense of force. So there he is casting and his, uh, you know, fireproof asbestos suits, um, molten bronze in his studio in rural Markhamville, which enabled him to start to do different work, things that looked like this. So the sort of safer production work, which, you know, we often would have in our kitchens of coffee mugs and so on became much more sculptural and artistic. Cast bronze, uh, with, with also sort of this sort of, I call this polymath of different materials of a molten glass and ceramic, like the piece on the left, which is uh, owned by the Art Gallery in Nova Scotia. And one of the things he's most known for, of course, is his 90s Raku wear. Uh, just absolutely beautiful work. And this is how I first came to know Peter's work. Things like this, the vase with that, that crackled white glaze with this um, 
the sort of almost this, this kind of ageless, almost uh, archaeological quality to it. And, and this sort of rainbow colors, which are always left up to chance. When I'll, he'll, he'll certainly explain this with the Raku process, but with the firing, you never quite know what's going to happen when it comes out. So these beautiful sort of pieces in the 90s, and there's some other ones. These are called Raku Jewel Pots from 1996. Beautiful, stunning colors. Um, and, you know, to, to do craft like this, we're so excited to show it at the gallery. And of course, with the beauty of his photographs is it captures them as they were fresh out because sometimes he said if these are in the light they can sometimes fade a little bit but again you know to, i've never seen such vibrant colors as this in any ceramic work anywhere now one of the things that peter also did beyond the sort of uh, um, kind of sculptural more things we're dealing with with color and beauty and so on he also dealt with a long line of, of functional pots as we mentioned in the beginning but even returning to that as well all throughout his career, uh, even this is a work in the late 1990s called Teapot with Cane Handle. So uh, this actually came from his uh, from his kitchen. So a lot of the stuff, of course, he still wears uses. Um, one of the things that we also were able to discover and certainly celebrate in this book were some little experiments that he's done throughout the years, even going back to the early 1980s, working with a foundry in St. John. This is a bronze work called Untitled in 1980. It's small. It fits in the palm of your hand. It's about the size of a, you know, of a baseball, say. Uh, these beautiful, um, these sort of volumetric, very architectural works with, with mass. And, and you can see a, a very sort of geological, but also the idea of, uh, of, of happenstance. It works with this, some erosion coming in. Just a sense of something that's, that's, that's timeless. Um, and it's, it's this beautiful sort of pieces that, that have been, uh, just a joy to include in the book with his with things like his Raku pieces that are more well known. Peter also has a great sense of humor. And I think maybe dealing with me, hopefully that came out a little bit. But look at this portrait of the artist is an aging beach ball 1983. That's Peter's face as a cast he did. He did two of these. And this is actually in his in his living room. And and I, I love this because you know he saw himself as this aging guy who's kind of getting into his 30s. But a um, uh, long time ago now. But just the idea of kind of this playfulness of dealing again with some metal casting uh, volume. There, there's, there's something about just this wonderful thing about the light on the surface of this beyond even the sort of theme of him with the horns and the devil, but also not being very serious about the work, but not taking himself too seriously. Really struck by that. Another kind of interesting one, one banana, two banana from 1993. Just a sense of play and fun is there. Um, uh, of course, he worked in, in oftentimes, Peter's never repeated himself, but uh, he'll often work in some series and sort of play with the, these sort of, uh, these, these different sort of forms and, and mediums and volumes and shapes that he really enjoys coming back to. One of those was the New Hope, uh, or sorry, the Nimbus series. This is one called New Hope Nimbus. In the early 2000s, these are wall hanging works in a circle, he calls the Nimbus series with molten glass, metal, sort of kind of fractured look uh, in those with some sandblasted glass as the ring uh, series that he was very well known for in the early 2000s. Uh, Peter also uh, spent a while dealing with photography as well as some large scale photographs he would often uh, put on, uh, on aluminum sheets. This is an example called Leaves of Grass where he would often, uh, whether it's throwing books or dealing with, with the book as a form in itself, whether it's burning the books, rotting the books and then photographing them this is one as it flies through the air. So just this fascination with, with the printed word and how that sort of changes over time. And of course, books are central to their household with Beth being the celebrated writer that she was. Uh, over the last, uh, say, certainly the last 20 years, a great part of his, uh, his output has been public art, like this large piece called Touchstone, which he did in Canmore, Alberta in 2012. And I, I love that photograph. To, uh, to the left with the crowd around it, and the band, the bass player there, the celebration, and this beautiful landscape and how it absolutely fits and just resonates with that landscape of the Rockies around it. And of course, we'll speak to this in a bit, but how this public participation, the public bringing in objects that are then cast in bronze on the piece. So there's this, this sense of, of openness and connection to the citizens of the place as well. And also some other contemporary works he does. This is a very recent one called Reconstruction. Um, we will take, um, you know, sort of traditional, very decorated, almost these Baroque dishes, shatter or break them, and, and then reconstruct them in pieces. So they still look like elements from uh, this kind of archaeological reconstruction, but still very contemporary. Um, one of the things I realized about talking about Peter's work is you actually can't talk about it in about five, 10 minutes. 
so this is just kind of an introduction of a number of things that uh, and techniques and materials and paths and interests that he's had. Um, it's been a joy to put it throughout the book. It was complicated. Peter had a huge part in, in assembling the photographs and choosing these and, and helping me put it together. So I really want to thank him for that. And we're going to stop sharing now. And uh, I think we're going to start some discussion. And now I'm also going to put the, the chat line up here next to me in case anyone has any questions. So, um, so with all that, yeah, 50 years in, in about eight minutes. So good luck. Good luck with that. Right, Peter? Um, yeah, right. What, 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 how do you feel with people talking about you in 50 years of a career? I mean, does it feel like 50 years? It's beginning to, thanks to you. Um, <laughs> yeah. My head is spinning, really. Uh, I think one of the things I want to say right off the bat is that it it has been a real pleasure to work work with you and the people that were associated with the book and working with Goose Lane and the Beaverbrook in general. It's uh, it's been an uh, a ride. It's been a really interesting time and in a career and a life in which I was frequently too busy to pause. Um, this has been a very reflective, it's been busy, but it's also been reflective. And the book is given me perspective on things I've done in a way that is, well, it's flattering frankly it it doesn't show the piles of uh stuff that are filled holes in the driveway or you know shouldn't have been sold and all that stuff but it's it's uh i am thrilled with the whole thing to be honest with you and thank you very much for that john oh that's great um one of the things that's most striking about this peter is is just the varied material you know the expansiveness i call it this word i don't think i ever even knew the word existed before i wrote the book but but i think you're one of the most uh uh, extensive polymaths in Canadian art. You know, you've dealt with with various materials. You probably worked with about fifteen materials, but I think beyond being, you know, ceramics, glass, metal, wood, photography, found objects. Uh, you know, it's it, clay. It, it just it keeps going and going and going. What's driven you to use those different materials? Because most artists, if they're ceramic artists, they they make clay objects and they can play with form, but they stay with clay. The same with metal. You've you work with all these. Plus, you've also built the studio to be able to do it at great expense and effort. What's driven you to explore these different materials? Well, I don't know if I've got a really good answer to that, but I mean, curiosity is part of it. Um, probably frustration at times, not being able to achieve things with a single material that I was interested in doing. Um, and, and I've often said, when I got frustrated with one material, I could switch to another one. And as I very early on, I discovered that I was really uh, was interested in working in mixed mixed media. And I thought the bringing together the, the ceramic, uh, what I'd been doing in ceramics with metal at first and then eventually with uh, glass, slump glass. I, I love the way they played off each other and the element of, um, well, they, 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 they all involved uh, fire, you know, they, they all involved melting, they all involved a kind of immediacy to the process with being in there with the raku firing, you know, pulling red hot pots out of the kiln and surrounded by smoke and sparks and flames and pouring bronze, all those all those things that they give to the material something of the the process. I, I call it the uh, oh, what was it the, the the hot step process where you're just you are so focused on what you're doing. Um, you're not worrying about the uh, the to do list or or what's next. You're you're there, so there was a, an element of that that kind of informs things. But it expanded it expanded possibilities of what I could do, and honestly, it made life more interesting for me. Yeah, no, absolutely. One of the things I know that I can see you've got some works there behind you. 
And I was wondering if you could actually grab the small Raku horn vase that's right behind you, because I want to ask you a question about that as well. Um, I know, you know, looking, yeah, and looking at your projects, dealing with dealing with scale, you work for everything from these tiny, tiny works, mammoth ones, and that one, there, there's still, there's a monumentality to it, even though you can hold it in your hand. I mean, it's about the size of a thermos. But you've done works like that. You've done works that are similar. I think Shards of Time in, in St. John. Yeah, there you go. A perfect analogy. But Shards of Time is not that much different in that sort of form-wise, but it's, you know, 20 feet in diameter or more, 30 feet in diameter. How do you deal with, with scale, you know, uh, of, of working with, when do you decide that something is small versus large? How do you play with that? Well, um, I I was interested with scale from pretty early on. I know I, I even in that shot you had from 1974, there was a pot there I'd completely forgotten about that must have been as tall as the kiln would allow me to make a single object. Um, you know, that kind of heroic potter thing. There, um, I, I liked I liked the physicality of it, but you know it moved when when I began doing uh, garden sculpture things that were six or seven feet tall. Part part of the impulse was I I did want to work bigger and I wanted to do commission work, but I couldn't show somebody a small thing and say, oh, let's see, this is a a model for a, a big big commission. Well, I couldn't make this, this scale, and say, well, I can make that for you 30 feet tall. Will you pay me to do it? So I started making things that were six or seven feet tall that I could move the parts around with and and had those in solo shows in various galleries, principally Sandra Inslee Gallery in Toronto to begin with. And that was a step on the way to kind of qualifying to be able to take be taken seriously for larger public commissions. And I get, you know, there are re, there's a relationship between the smaller work and the bigger work. It's, it's not terribly conscious on my part. Um, one of the biggest challenges with big work is that it becomes a real project management uh, challenge you know there's budgets there's deadlines there's working with subcontractors there's a whole range of other challenges that i i kind of it it drove me crazy at times but i kind of thrived on it too um that was so it was really nice to scuttle back to the studio and make a pot after spending a year juggling all the parts to putting together a, a big commission and getting it installed and insured and, and all the complications around that. I'm not sure I answered your question. Well, no, but, it's good. I mean, it's one of those things where I know in talking to you, being, you know, being an architect, the, the large pieces, it's, it's not about just you, you're a fraction of it. It's, it's other people that do a lot of the production of it. It becomes complicated. When life was simpler, uh, say that photograph I showed in 1974, you and Beth and going to Mac to quack. I mean, I almost, I sort of see that as in talking to a lot of people that were around then. they say the 1970s were really the glory years of the, the craftsperson in New Brunswick. There was huge interest in it in the early seventies. People would line up to get the work. Can you just tell us a little bit about that, those days. I don't want to <laughs> treat it as if you're, you know, you're a museum piece, but that is several, that's two generations back in the craft world. What was it like then as a young craftsperson in New Brunswick? It was just sort of post Dykeman, you know, some of the great, uh, you know, the, um, Sheldon Erica Dykeman, who really established ceramics in modern ceramics in Canada, were from New Brunswick. So you're you're kind of stepping on yeah. their not stepping on their shoulders. You're 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 standing on uh, kind of the shoulders of giants. There, what was it like? Oh, well, I, I was keenly aware of the Dykemans because every they lived in Sussex toward the ends of their the end of their career, and we we knew Erica, um, and. It, it, it was interesting. It was kind of exciting on one hand and a little bit irritating too, because any time I said it as a putter, oh, you, you, must, you must know about the Dykemans and they'd bring out a Dykeman piece. And, you know, so when you're 21 or 22, you don't really want to hear about old crocs like me. Um, 
but it, it in a way they they did they opened doors and paved the way so that when i showed up and others showed up there was already an awareness and a kind of sensibility about about the handmade and particularly with ceramics um so the it was a great time actually because there was a lot of excitement in the air about it there were a lot of people our age that had taken the leap to uh, working on their own and ma making handmade stuff. And there was a, a, as you say, a curiosity. I mean, Richard Hatfield used to come to all those craft fairs and he'd come to, you know, your booth and yak to you and you could yak at him about, you know, spraying the forest or something like that. And he'd leave his charge card with you and say, he'd come back later. and. You know, there was it was an exciting time, and you, those those uh, craft shows were like gatherings of the tribe. Um, you got to be very close with a lot of people that you saw periodically through the year through those through those venues. And you now, one of the really interesting things that was going on then is the I don't remember what they called the Brunswick Guild of Crafts, I think is what it was called, or. The, I'm not sure about the name, but it was making that shift from the, the, the kind of Dykeman's generation to all these eager young um, craftspeople, many of whom it had, had probably had university or some kind of background. And this, so there, there was this kind of welcoming of our coming in and also some tensions about the way the all the young people wanted to shift things and what categories were okay and setting up juries and all that. But it was uh, an exciting, an exciting time, and it was a very welcoming time to get established. That's great. Do you see that in in the the last couple of years? There seems to be a real revival and in interest in the handmade. Certainly, there's the whole maker movement. Uh, you know, the studio of things with with integrity as opposed to just, you know, production again of the, the kind of Walmart things from China that are cheap. There's an interest in in quality in the tactile. How, how do you see that today? Have you found that uh, that to be the case? Well, things have, <clears throat> have changed enormously. I mean, um, in terms of the way you get what you make to a market, um, <laughs> the the craft show you used to be able to go to Mactaquack and the Fundy, the Fundy Craft Show, uh, and make maybe a third or a half of your annual income. That may be a little high, but anyway, it was a significant thing. By the by, the 80s, there were so many craft shows. You had to go to five or six to make what you used to do in two. So that that's that's shifted. So marketing is a different thing. But I think the desire, the kind of yearning, of people to surround themselves with things that they feel identify them in some way that a piece of Tupperware or mass-produced silverware or their car doesn't, um, is we surround ourselves with these talismans of things that we feel collectively kind of identify us. And those things, I think it, it, it it fluctuates a lot, but the things that are from the place where we live and things that identify with us most closely are things that are made by people we can identify or know about. And they're not made by some invisible hand or robot, you know, offshore somewhere. So I think I, th I think there will probably always be that uh, yearning for that sense of identity that comes through the handmade and, and the visual, it, it, it's the same with music, but uh, these are things that are tactile that you can have and take home and see every day and live with. I'm oh, sure. Speaking of tactility, uh, if I could get you to grab the, the white and blue raccoon piece that's just there to your to your right. Um, I know that has one of the, um, those, uh, it's done from the early 90s. I know that's in the book as well, uh, 30 years old. But it, it still it still has this very kind of contemporary look to it, I, and I think that, that one of the things, whether it's it's through uh, through form, but then your decoration and these colors that you use, tell us about what would have been going through your mind at that time. I'm going to ask you something similar to something you've done just a year or two ago on your other side. But first, okay, of, of that piece, you you said you did 
you know, hundreds of these uh, back in the day. And, and you really seemed, that seemed to be a time where you really found your voice. You could tell that was, that was a Peter Pounding work, this kind of classic era. T tell us about how that came about. Well, I'm going to put it down. Sure. But we can get insight. Um, well, I kind of reached a point, I think, of whew, a d design ability or maturity or something where I, I began to develop this approach to work that wasn't just um, based on the vagaries of a stoneware glaze, for example. And the graphic images on these interested me. <clears throat> and I I developed a way to be able to fire a lot of Raku year round with an indoor an indoor process with uh, air supply and a firefighter's hood and all that stuff. But it also meant that I could uh, make these vessels and do the gra and outline the graphics. And I had people working for me at that point that uh, did did the glazing. I would note what glazes I wanted where and each each one of these colors had to get three coats of color. This is a pretty simple one compared to some of the things I was doing. So that was always a kind of a calculation <clears throat> was how how much time it was going to take for for somebody t to finish it. So I it was a combination of kind of finding a voice in a form that I found uh, satisfying and expressive, but also a method to produce that uh, reliably and in, in enough volume to make a living at it. So I usually had two or three part-time people working, full-time part-time people working, doing various things. And I, I essentially turned myself into a machine in those years, just throwing like crazy. Um, and you know, that, that eventually came to an end too. I, I, yeah, I kind of wore myself out with it after about, geez, maybe 10 years, 10 or 12 years. But I, I look at the, the best of that work. I still find really satisfying. It is. It's compelling. Cause even behind you, you happen to have two, just even behind your head on the, on the bookcase. Uh, there's a few more from that era and. You can really see the the variations on a theme. Just well, as yeah, two, uh, three more up there. But just the idea of this, um, this this kind of endless endless sort of uh, vein of, of very very simple sort of geometries and forms that that have this kind of classic timeless quality to them. But you've always obviously been interested in this kind of archaeological aspect of it too. Whether it's sort of the this kind of classic sort of Greek forms of vases. But I think that draws me to. The recent work that you've done just in the last year on to your other shoulder those sort of fractured plates where you rebuild where you rebuild pieces out of uh out of bronze so in fact that was your last show which you showed last year and in saint john yeah why don't you tell us a little bit about those because they're the things really are cracked and then reassembled yeah well i you know, as we worked on the book, John, I mean, one of the things became clear, I was breaking and reassembling things from from way back. Way back yeah. um, and and part, of, part of that impulse came from haunting museums uh, like the, the in uh, London in particular, but almost everywhere we went, you would find reconstructed archaeological finds that were just shards reassembled and either left open or filled in with plaster and sometimes with gold, which just knocked my socks off. I spent a lot of time trying to make it look like I was doing it with gold, with gold leaf and things. But I, lo I love the metaphor of that and the sense of transformation of the parts into other materials. There's a lot of things I cast in bronze and it, it uh, to me, it makes you stop and uh, your relationship to the ordinary um, is kicked sideways a little bit. You, you re-examine, you know, and the, the idea of value, you know, these uh, lovely porcelain pieces with the hand-painted details or decals. Uh, 
I break them, and that's kind of fun. <laughs> but then I turn I turn them into into something that is the same yet different. You know, that's been transformed, and there's you know uh, some something else going on there. And I think that's that's one of the reasons why some of them I added things like I don't know if that does that oh, Beagle show. Beagle. Yeah, yeah, totally. Yeah. So, so there's a a cast bronze beetle in there, which is to me kind of a, a, a reconnection with nature. The the idea of that cycle continuing on, and that's that whole fragmentation thing and the metaphor for the, our our personal uh, our body and our emotional stability and all those things. There's some there, there's a lot of metaphor metaphoric stuff going on in my head with with these whether people get that or not i'm not sure one of the things I, I you mentioned that there the you know the ordinary becoming the extraordinary which is is really one of the most striking things i think about your work is even your your functional work and if i can ask you to grab something behind you there's a teapot in the bookcase right behind you um <coughs> um just just the idea that that even even these sort of mundane objects can become pieces of, of visual poetry. Um, tell us tell us a bit about about how you how you designed that teapot. Why why it matters? There's the fact that you've got this this hint of color, this almost Dr. Seuss hat on the top, uh, with sort of a traditional kind of cane 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 handle. Yeah, exactly. But there's there's something absolutely there's something very functional about it. About playful quality you can tell that that the same care that went into that is a swiss watch you can just it exudes that well how does the ordinary I mean, become extraordinary in your mind luck i i i don't know it i think i think with pots there's there's something about that repetition of finding form in the process it's not so it's not so premeditated it's and and the the subtle shifts within a form that you are trying to repeat can be extraordinary the difference between something that really sings and is is successful and something that just doesn't quite cut it are pretty elusive um and and i i one of the things i like about what i do is the the, the process of discovery as i work it's not quite like you've got everything designed, you've drawn it, you know what the glaze is going to do, you know how everything is going to connect and work out, and the firing is going to go exactly the way you planned it. There's always that element of uh, accident, lucky accident and unlucky accident that happens with these things. And that's part of what makes them special i think is they've they've gone through this transformation first through your hands and then by fire um and i often don't know how good something is to well after it's finished it was one of the interesting things about working on this book is seeing stuff i hadn't seen in years and thinking geez you know that i like that or holy smoke let's not have that in the book um yeah, it just, there there were a number of, of slides that you you would have taken the slides, probably put them in a book, and they'd been there for for thirty or forty years, and not from our discovery. We said this is a magnificent piece, and then we you know, we scan it and, and print it. There's there's certainly some early kind of cast pieces, and was it some of those metal castings you you hadn't probably thought too much of those in decades. No. I told the story of casting them in St. John with a foundry that no longer exists and, yeah. and with collaborating. And, but they're, they're astounding pieces. Um, you know, I, I think there's an, uh, that I've always had this uh, admiration for uh, Japanese ceramics. And there's a sense of that kind of almost gestural flow and successful design that isn't isn't too conscious. There's that fine line between being having things be overthought and having things that come from practice and skill that evolve to become what they are and not kind of 
deadened by doing too much thinking about them. You have any idea what I mean? <laughs> well, I, I think I, <laughs> I do a little bit of being a fan of Japanese ceramics. I do. Um, one of the things I'd like to do is one last thing before we get Beth in here is I just show, certainly show the, the book, um, which, which one of the things about this, which I thought in discussions with you uh, was, was how do you organize the career of someone uh, as, uh, as, as varied with a varied career as you? So we have the essays in the beginning. And then basically at the end, we have, have essentially a, a chronology from, from your, first, your first pieces from the early 1970s sort of flowing flowing through to the stuff in the 80s and in in the 90s and then up to the stuff of of today and through your photographic works and in in doing that i mean three quarters of this book is this sort of visual timeline going back to again you know even very contemporary public art things that probably still feel very fresh you can probably still you know feel the feel the casting that you did on this one of my favorite pieces here this this large piece of uh, of marble and, and bronze from just a few years ago you know in in measuring a career i hope i know the answer to this you know retrospective people always feel it's the curse of well that's it you know that's that's my my epitaph but you're still working you know constantly producing new work i mean how do you see the next say 10 20 years of your career going do you, do you have any sort of visions of things you'd like to achieve well i um, no, not really. I mean, I'm still working, but I mean, looking back on 50 years, I didn't plan to get wherever I am now. It, it just happened. And, you know, you, you do set short term goals, but you would get wound up in life and everything and you bob and weave and try to make things work. I'm at a point in my life now where the pressure that I felt most of my life to to make enough money for us to live on between Beth and me um, is not completely gone, but it's a lot less than it was. And I feel I, I have a certain sense of confidence that, you know, we'll manage all right. Um, but I also don't want to fall into the void. So I, I am working on commissions. I've got ideas for smaller things. One of the big challenges will be that with fewer deadlines to kind of drive me forward, um, what what that'll be. Will I be able to kind of squirt off in directions that take no consideration for what anybody else thinks of what I'm doing? Or will I always have that little thing in my head wanting to be sure that this connects? And I think I think that's deeply ingrained. I think in a way it's it's it would be like writing. You you can be a very good writer, but if you don't find an audience, you haven't completed what you set out to do. So I think that 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 artistic need to connect and com to complete the the transaction, and I don't mean that in the monetary sense, but to make that connection and to find your way into other people's lives and hearts is kind of a key to um, an artist's life. I don't expect that to go away. Mm -hmm. Maybe this would be a good spot to bring Beth in. I know she's uh, she's there as our a guest there. So <laughs> Beth she's Downing. lurking. Yeah, she, she, she's going to come and join us for the last couple minutes here. Um, we got to squeeze her in here. Yeah. Great lens. Hi, Beth. <laughs> Sure. Hi guys. Yeah. So Beth, look, and again, thank you so much for uh, for providing the afterword to the book. I mean, it really gave a great tone of, of certainly of your life and uh, in in Markinville, but I know some of the other things that that really matter to you both uh, as as a as a couple are our uh, our community connection, uh, uh, sustainability, uh, just awareness of, of of nature and the environment and. Uh, and I, I just wonder if you could talk about a little bit about that. I know that, you know, of, of your lives together, of things that, that also matter to you uh, within the community that you've been able to achieve over the last little bit. You know, so what's, what are some of the things that to you, Peter, has really cared about outside of just simply producing uh, the sculpture and visual art? Well, we were, um, we met in 1969. Um, I was a... 
1968 on a blind date. Um, I was a theater major and then I became a creative writing. I, my degree is in creative writing. Um, so there have been some things that have, that have lasted, been very um, consistent. Um, I'm a writer now. I always wanted to be a writer since I was eight. So that was a um, something that was was going to have to work into our lives. But in 1970 was um, Earth the first Earth Day, and that had a profound uh, and lasting, lifelong influence on us. Um, and so our goals, when we were in our early 20s, were that we would live in such a way as to um, grow all our own food and live in the country and you know and originally we we had far greater um you know we our ideas were quite nuts i mean we were going to do everything we were going to make our own butter and have a cow and you know make our own grain and and not even make it not even be connected to the monetary to the economy we would just be you know hand you know uh but what was the word self-sufficient so, so, totally self-sufficient and we were very interested and did a lot of reading um, of people in the 1940s who had this same idea um, and so but we still have enormous vegetable gardens we have two freezers full of food we have a root cellar we have um, lettuce growing under a grow light in our cellar we um, we've this has been something that we've always done and then we've we've lived in the same place our whole lives so we have paths through our woods that we walk on or ski on every single day of our lives and so um that connection to the land and to the community because because we live in a little valley so it's a geographical cup like this with people living in it. And we're very connected in this uh, community. So that that forms our lives too. Yeah, and it's so, it's so tangible. And I know, I think that's why there's so much also just important affection. I know that you give New Brunswick, but that New Brunswick and Canada has for you too. And I know it's, uh, it's, it's been really palpable working on this, how, how excited people are to be able to share you know the Peter Pounding work, and of course, then the, then the the Beth Pounding aspect always comes into it as well, which is which is great. Can I ask you, Beth, what are what are some of your your favorite pieces of Peter's, and and why? Um, is the coyote piece in the book? The coyote yeah. piece is not in the book, <laughs> but you can talk about it's it. One my, it's one of my favorite pieces. It's a it's a it's a raku piece with coyotes chasing each other around the rim. I love that piece. Um, I love the piece that's in Canmore. Uh, the public, public commission. Piece, yeah. Yeah, that's my favorite. That was a stupendous project from the beginning to the end. Being in Canmore, I was there when it happened. And um, the, the, the community was so excited and had so much to do yeah. with bringing things to that. And that, I think Peter loved that, in my view, that was the least stressful of the big commissions, because those big commissions are extremely stressful. That one had such a great support from the community that it made it flow well, and it's a beautiful piece. I love that piece. Mm -hmm. I also love the fact that every single day we eat off of porcelain plates that Peter made and use mugs, and, you know, I love his teapots. Um, yeah. I'm just, the pieces are like part of our lives. Like we were looking at that picture from 1974. I can feel those because I was the packer. I was the emballagiste <laughs> and, uh, I spent hours and hours packing those pots, wrapping them in bubble wrap, putting them in, putting this, you know, stuff around them. And I can still feel them in every, and so we looked at that picture from 1974 and said, yeah, I remember that mug. I remember that bowl. I, it's like you can remember every single one of thousands and thousands of pieces. Mm -hmm. It's really weird. We can it, really remember. Yeah, you get to, I know uh, even, you know, times where I've, I've ever had to do, you know, do a sketch or a drawing in a place. If you stop and take the time, just even the 20 minutes of stopping and looking and drawing something, 
you, it, it never, never leaves your, your brain. That sort of visual awareness always comes back. So that doesn't surprise me, but you think of how many, how many coffee mugs you can picture in your brain, <laughs> all those things. Yeah. How, how are those artistic sensibilities? I mean, your household is, you have, you know, Peter, the visual now, and you're a photographer too, and a wonderful photographer. When I first knew of you, it was, it was through, through your photography, even before your writing, but you know, the visual just absolutely, uh, you know, immerses itself in your son, Jake, who is, is changed to, is, is at school now, but he was a swordsmith for the 15, 20 years, you know, how, how has this, the visual really matters to you of making, you know, how, tell us about that. Uh, me, we're, sure. we're makers. We're constantly making, we're, we're just, okay. Right now there's a seven foot rooster on our front lawn that was made within the last few days as a challenge because a chicken appeared on the chicken house of our neighbors across the valley. So now there's a rooster on our front lawn made by Peter. Meanwhile, I'm frantically finishing knitting and making baskets and all these presents for Christmas because we're not going shopping. But we're always making things. We just love to make things. It's just part of, of our lives. And we also love to look at things. And like one of the wonderful things about our relationship is we will both appreciate the fact that we see these the way the ice is formed on the twigs. And it's a matter of let's look at this for quite a long time and study it and look at, we love to look at things. Peter taught me to love color. Um, he would always say, look at the colors of that. So I think we're both very visual and then uh, there are different aspects of our lives of our artistic practice that enrich each other. Like mine will be the interior of people. And will I, I, that's my world that I put into novels. And Peter's is more form. And so I think we give each other quite a bit. It's great being married to artists being married mm -hmm. or living together, being partners. <laughs> no, absolutely. Um, I can see that I think we might be close to the end of it, Megan's coming back on. So I'm just going to throw it back to her for a second. Megan, I'm not sure if you have some, some questions from viewers or if we're near the end, but uh, yeah, yeah, we're getting, we're getting close to time now. So I wanted to make sure that we got to some of our viewer questions that we have in the comments. Um, so I'll throw the first one at you guys. It's from Ravel to expand. And um, they say, are there any particular petroglyphs in Eastern Canada that have inspired your work? And I might be saying that wrong. It might be petroglyphs or it's an art term you guys will have to correct me on it um and what have these glyphs inspired um your glyph glass piece well <clears throat> glyphs are a big subject and petroglyphs are um that's that's the term it's an archaeological term and it's essentially like cave paintings and handprints on walls, those kinds of things are petroglyphs. And I wouldn't say I'm inspired by them in general, but there aren't any specific ones uh, that come to mind here. We, we, we stumbled across some in, is that Utah? Mm. And we were hiking way back in the hinterland in a historic monument in this valley and came on handprints on the wall in a kind of a carved out area and when we asked the uh, rangers about them said oh nobody's supposed to go there we don't tell anybody about that but it was such a visceral thing to find that and that those handprints were three or four thousand years old amazing but glyphs, for me, the, the, the mark of the human hand, that, that, that need to communicate visually um, fascinate me. And that's, that's been a, a part of a, lot of a lot of my work, an exploration of that. And I, I'm curious about and moved by this idea that you see these marks, these human marks, and even if it's cuneiform or some language you don't understand, there's still the sense of humanness and a sense of communicating something, if it's only humanness, um, that I find uh, really interesting and kind of moving. Awesome. Thank you very much.
Um, so our next one here is from Sam, and it's touching back on the very beginning of our presentation when we when we saw that um, that one of your first mugs that you had made. Um, Sam asks, do you ever miss making those brown mugs now that you're um, ingrained in all of this all of this sculpture work? Uh no, I, 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 I made enough thousands of mugs, so I don't really miss making them. Um, no, I don't, I don't miss it. I, I made enough mugs. <laughs> Let somebody else make the mugs now. <laughs> um, so our next one comes from Jane. Um, and Jane says, regarding your public cast sculptures, do you have a favorite story from one of the pieces that folks brought to you? They've got many, many uh, good stories from, this is from people bringing in personal treasures or artifacts for me to make impressions of somewhat like, here's an example of one. There's a, a key and that's in a peak cast cast brown. So some of the surfaces on my public art include uh, relief that was made by collecting um, artifacts, making impressions, and then including them in this textural area in, in public art. And part of that was um, dealing with it, a desire to have the public involved, have community um, the community involved in the imagery and the work. And just a quickie, one of one of my favorites was in Canmore. I had a lot of good ones in Canmore, but somebody, this woman who had won an Olympic medal, gold medal, brought her gold medal in to me. And I took a look at it and I thought, ee. And I had a, a, this uh, silicone membrane that I would push them through into the clay so that they didn't get dirty or anything. And I, I said, just before I do it, I said, well, you know, I'm about to turn your gold medal into bronze, which I thought was funny. And she said, that's OK. I've still got the original. Awesome. Um, so our next question is, how did the process of making the book affect how you view your career and where are you now? Did you gain a different or better understanding of certain aspects of your work you're doing today? Yeah, it's been a real, um, it's been a process that's, that's, it's been a maturing process and a kind of a reality check. And it was a collaboration. And I think, you know, one of the, one of the things that I learned through public art, um, was how much I enjoy collaboration and working with people on on something and and working with John and the and uh, Goose Lane on this has been a, a fantastic fantastic experience <clears throat> and it's put it's put a career in a in a nice nice perspective for me um, and I've I've gone through and seen a lot of things that I'd pretty much forgotten about. Um, so it's, it's been a, it's been a really interesting process. There were times when I, I was worried that it was like going to be my tombstone, but I don't feel that way anymore. I'm excited by it. I'm glad, I'm very glad you don't feel that way anymore. Um, so it looks like we're at three o'clock now. So I'll read our last question is more of a statement, but I feel like you guys deserve to hear it. It's from Kim. Kim says, both of you and Jake too are obviously some of the most inspiring creative people and are true New Brunswick treasures. Thank you for all the years of work and beautiful creation. Well, thank you, Tim. <laughs> and um, with that, that's going to, um, that's gonna end things uh, for us for today. Um, so just a reminder for everyone who's tuning in, um, you can get a copy of the book at gooselane.com and it is signed. Or if you're local here in Fredericton, you can stop by Westminster Books and get a signed copy there. Um, so thank you on behalf of Goose Lane and the Beaverbrook Art Gallery for joining us here. 
And I'll give the last words up to John and Peter, if you guys would like to say goodbye to the audience. Great, thanks so much. I, I just want to wish everyone a Merry Christmas. And again, one of the great gifts of me has been a challenging year. 2020 is, has been tricky in many ways, but it's been a gift to be able to work with, with Peter and Beth and, and that they've become uh, beyond just collaborators as very good friends. And, and you, are, you are New Brunswick treasures, both of you. So thank you. Well, I, I, for me, this book has made 2020 more, you know, more than bearable through all the, the strains of the year and uh, isolation and everything. This has helped to be a connecting, a connecting thread through the time. And uh, geez, I'm, I'm so grateful for that opportunity. And have a great holiday, everybody. And thanks for tuning in. All right. Thank you, everyone. Enjoy the rest of your Sunday. And that's all from us.